Let's talk about the seven seals of the book of Revelation. And here to discuss this very important subject is pastor, teacher, Billy Crone. Billy, welcome back to Prophecy Watchers. Gary, thanks. It's always great to be on. And it's always great to have you here. Billy has just written a book called The Seals. It's, it's devoted to the subject of the seven seals of the book of Revelation. And the way Billy has put this thing together, it's an extremely important subject. How did you approach The Seals? literally wanted to just take the time, be exhaustive, and really just tear it apart. And that's why we, that's exactly what we did, Gary. We, we've called it the seals, a panoramic view of the first half of the seven-year tribulation. We wanted to tear it apart for all it's worth. Not gloss over it, not just mm-hmm. breeze by it, but literally line by line, verse by verse, word by word, in the original language, it, we tore it apart. We went back into the history, the customs, the mannerisms, and we wanted to see what is really going on here in its fullness. If you think the English is expressive, wait till you get to the original language. So many things popped out there uh-huh. that uh, I think is very important for people to understand today. Now the seals uh, essentially are the first half of the yeah. tribulation. And uh, a lot of people look at those and they say, oh well there are seven seals and uh, I think, you know, uh, one of these days those are going to be opened and we're probably still going to be on earth and, and we'll be <laughs> going through that period and re- we will remain on earth while those seals are being opened. And a yeah. lot of Christians actually uh, sort of assume that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you uh, have taken an entirely different view. Well, yeah, and it's not just my view, it's not just convenient because I'm guilty of escapism, I don't want to be there. <laughs> that It is so abundantly clear. Uh, that we're not going to be there. And we derive that, again, not just from some convenient escapism. We go back to where the seven-year tribulation appears in its foundation. And that's Daniel uh, chapter 9 when we deal with Daniel's 70th week prophecy. Mm -hmm. And Daniel clearly tells us the reason why it's a seven-year, not a two-year, not a a three-and-a-half year, not a 192-year, but a seven-year tribulation is it's the final seven, the final week of Daniel's 70th week prophecy. So that's number one. Number two, in that historical context, Daniel tells you what is the purpose of that final week? It has nothing to do with the church. It can't have anything to do with the church, number one. Because when Daniel wrote the 70th week prophecy in the book of Daniel, the church wasn't even in existence. The church Mm -hmm. wasn't even in existence for about 570 years later. Also the New Testament writers tell us that the, uh, uh, the Old Testament writers, including Daniel, the church was a mystery. They had no knowledge of the church. So how could he be writing about the church? He's not. He tells us the purpose of the seven year tribulation is about God is not done with the Jewish people. He's going to pull out his remnant. He's going to fulfill the promises that he's uh, uh, that have yet to occur with someone, Jesus, ruling and reigning from Jerusalem, the millennial kingdom, all that stuff. That hasn't happened yet. As well as pouring out his wrath during the seven year tribulation upon the unbelieving Gentile nations. So the whole purpose, there's no way you can squeeze the church in there, number one. Number two, how anybody can sit there and say that the church is going to be in this first half in the sealed judgment is beyond me. It's not just ludicrous, I'll use this word, blasphemous. Because when you look at the scripture, God repeatedly says He is the one who is dishing out all these judgments in the first half, the sealed judgments. Okay, and it's clearly His wrath, right? His His wrath is not in the just the second half. His wrath is from the moment the Antichrist makes that covenant with Israel, Daniel nine twenty seven, Revelation six one, the first seal, the white horse rider. From that moment forward, it is nonstop God's wrath, and, and that's the game that people play. They want to say, well, this first half it isn't really man's wrath, it's, it, it's uh, Satan's, or it's not really God's wrath, it's, it's Satan's wrath or man's wrath. It's like, what are you talking about? It, yeah. it, there's no way you can derive that if you just stop and look at what's going on uh, in the sealed judgments. And I get why they're trying to do that, Gary. Yeah. Because they're trying to squeeze the church into the first half of the seven year tribulation. You can't do that. And the reason why they do that is because they got their own conundrum. Okay, And that is this. The Bible is very clear. God has not, on top of the tribulation, has nothing to do with the church. God says that the that He has not appointed His church unto His wrath. Romans chapter five and First Thessalonians one, First Thessalonians five, 
which is very interesting, before and after the rapture passage, mm-hmm. right, that Paul mentions, yes. says that we are not appointed unto God's wrath, we are rescued from God's wrath, we are saved from God's wrath. The church cannot be in God's wrath. So that's why they do what they do. They want the church in that first half of the seven year tribulation, but then they got a problem. But, but wait a second, the church can't be in the wrath. So they want to say that this is not God's wrath, it's man's wrath or Satan's wrath. Said all that to get to this. You cannot derive that belief if you stick with the scripture, and that's what we're supposed to do. Now, now let me just give you a little teaser of how redundant God is saying, listen, his wrath is being poured out through the entire book uh, uh, or the entire seven year tribulation, right? It isn't yes. just the second half. There's no way you could say that the first half is man's wrath or Satan's wrath. It's impossible. And now, to do that, you got to go back into the context. The context starts actually with Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. What's going on here? That is the throne room scene of God. And what's happening, and that's chapter 4. Chapter 5 is what? It's the whole vision that John sees of the scroll. What's the scroll? The scroll is the self-contained sealed unit that is going to unleash all the judgments. The seals, the trumpets, the bowls, right? It's the whole, that's the scroll, right? And it says right there, who is the only one in the universe who is worthy to take that scroll, to open the scroll? Mm -hmm. There's nobody right? Except one, the Lamb. It didn't say man could open the scroll. It didn't say Satan could open the scroll. It's the Lamb. Jesus Christ opens the scroll. What's that scroll? That scroll is what unleashes all the wrathful judgments from God on planet earth in the seven year tribulation. I haven't got to six yet. Now you get into six. It's extremely redundant. Uh, you know, again, I, I already mentioned Daniel 9 had nothing to do with the church. The context, Revelation 4 and 5, it's the throne room scene of God. It's the Lamb who dishes that. And then list, look at this. It's like, how could you say this is coming from man or Satan's beyond me? Revelation uh, 6, it says right there, very first verse, right? This is the beginning of the seven year tribulation. Mm-hmm. This is a correlation to Matthew 24, Daniel uh, 9 27, when the Antichrist makes the covenant with Israel. It's the same thing, Revelation 6 1. It says here, how's it all start? the beginning of the seven year tribulation, I watched as the who, who opened the first of the seven seals? It's the lamb. Of course, because he's Mm -hmm. the one in the previous chapter who grabbed it. He was the only one. So it says there, and the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Where's these judgments coming from? They're coming from the lamb. That's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. It didn't say, and I watched as man opened this first seal. No, I watched as Satan. Makes you want to wash your tongue out. Uh, No, this is coming from the lamb. Then you go down and it says, what's the second seal? Verse three, I watched him when the what? The Lamb opened mm-hmm. the second seal. Go down to verse 5. And I watched the third seal. What? The Lamb opened the third seal. Right? Goes to number 4. And the Lamb opened the fourth seal. And then it switches to, and when He opened the fifth seal. And I watched as He opened the sixth seal. Go to Revelation 8, 1. And He. It says it right there. And the Lamb, and the Lamb, and the Lamb, and He, and He, and He. Contextually, it's still Jesus. Who's the one who is opening every single one of these seals? It's the Lamb. How could you yeah. sit there and say, this is coming from man or Satan? And it's even more than that. Just let me give you one little teaser. And this is throughout all of chapter 6, Gary, is after it says there, and the Lamb opened the first seal, right? and he says what? And then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, come. So who's given the order? Right? The Lamb opens it up. He's in charge. He's dishing this out. Now here comes a living creature, the cherubim. Who are the cherubims? The angelos, messenger. That's what the word angel means. It's a messenger of God. The, The cherubim don't work for man. They don't speak for yeah, Satan. That's true. This is coming from the throne of God. They and are they're the guardians the ones. of the throne. Exactly. So yeah. this ain't coming from Satan. They're not saying, and one of the four living creatures worked together with Satan to unleash. No. The four living creatures are coming from the throne room of God. On top of everything I just said. And they're the one that gives the order that says come. Oh, by the way, the word there, voice like thunder, thunder in the scripture is use of the voice of God. And uh, it always depicts uh, God's judgment and things of that nature uh, as well. So, th- on, and so then, not just that time, but you look at the next one and, and the first four that is being released and a living creature says come. So on top of the lamb and the lamb and the lamb and the lamb, they're being initiated through those who work for God, who are the messengers of God, the living creatures, on and on it goes. And there's even more than that, Gary, as you look at every single one of these seals. But that's, I actually wrote that in the preface. For the life of me, I cannot understand why people could sit there and even entertain the idea that these wrathful judgments from God in the first half, the sealed judgments, has anything to do with man or Satan. And, and all, it's not just ludicrous. Again, I'll use these words. That's blasphemous. According, I'm just reading the Bible. 
I haven't even gotten into the Greek or anything of that nature, Gary. The contextual evidence is this is all coming from the hand of God. And it's horrible, Gary. You don't want to be there. That's the message. You don't want to be in not just the second half. You don't want to be in the first half. Why? Because God, if anything, is screaming out from the text, this is all coming from Him. Not man, not Satan, and you don't want to be there. And you reminded me of something. I've opened my Bible to John chapter 5, verse 22, where it says, and these are Jesus' own words, it Mm -hmm. says, for the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Mm -hmm. Now that's a mouthful. Yeah, All judgment is committed to the Son. And we see that in Revelation. Yeah, in in verbatim. Again, every single seal. Not just the first one, not just some of them, not just half of them. Every single seal. Seven for seven. It's the Lamb and the Lamb and the Lamb and He and He and He opening these seals. And and In fact, let me explain another thing too, because sometimes they'll they'll say this, well, okay, uh, here in the sixth seal it says, uh, fall on us, the people of the earth, fall on us, and hide us from the face of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Right, and it says for the, for great the for the great day of the wrath has come, and who can stand? And so some people say, well, see, it actually doesn't start until there. Well, first of all, you just ignored everything we just talked about biblically. Daniel chapter nine, the seven year tribulation has nothing to do with the church. The church wasn't even in existence. Mm-hmm. Uh, Revelation chapter four and five, contextually, this is all coming from the throne room of God. This is the Lamb of God who holds the scroll that contains all the judgments. Then you just ignore every single seal in the first five says, and the Lamb, and the Lamb, and He, and He, and He. And it's coming from a, a living creature, the mm-hmm. cherubim from the throne room of God. Yeah. So, But I'll entertain that thought, right? If you just want to skip over that, I don't recommend that. But, but they say, well see it says there, and it has come. So that means it didn't start till then. That's not what it says, right? Uh, it, the, the words there, has come, is the eros tense, and it's past tense. And so basically when it says the wrath, the wrath has come, it's basically these people are just now acknowledging what's been going on already in the past, which completely fits the context. God's wrath has already been going on through and through. It didn't just come then, they're just now acknowledging it. And this is what's ironic, Gary. Here it is in this passage that we see that the unbelieving world, under the wrath of God, they finally get around to acknowledging, wow, these events have been coming from who? From Him, God the Father, who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Right? And we're in the first half still. Right? Yeah. It's funny that those people at that time in the future, they will acknowledge, the unbelieving Gentile nations, they will acknowledge that this is the wrath of God. But you have people with all due respect in the church today who won't. And you know, the people who make that acknowledgement are the movers and shakers of planet Earth. They're the generals, yeah. the, 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 the uh, leaders of nations. Uh, they are the, the, the directors of colleges. They are intellectuals, yeah. wealthy. And right here in Revelation they finally come to the knowledge that wow, judgment really has come from yeah. the Lamb. And they know exactly where it's coming from. Right? That's and again, amazing. It's the wrath of the Lamb, not yeah. of man, not of Satan. Right? Right. And they finally acknowledge. But again, people today, even in the church, they don't want to acknowledge it. That's what I find absolutely incredibly ironic. It's just, Ab- man, well, you're acting even worse with all due respect. You're acting worse than people in the seven year tribulation <laughs> under God's wrath. I mean, at least they will acknowledge it. How come you aren't? I, I, it just, I, I, and I'm sorry because I, I, it, it, that may sound harsh, Gary, but I, I just, I'm trying to be honest with the text. That's what we're supposed to do as Christians. Contextually, Daniel 9, chapter, Revelation 4 and 5, and every single seal, this is coming from God. How could you sit there and say that this is coming from man or Satan is beyond me? But, but so, I, and you're uh, making the case that the wrath begins with the opening of the first seal absolutely. and the riding forth of the white horse. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And again, that's what it says there is it, it's the lamb. This is, a, this is a, a, um, a direct correlation again with Daniel chapter 9 when the Antichrist, we, historically I think we would all agree on that, mm-hmm. what starts the seven year tribulation. In Daniel 9, 27. Right? When the Antichrist makes the covenant with the Jewish people. Right? Yeah if you will, a peace treaty, right? And that fits completely in the context of what's going on here in, in uh, Revelation 6 with the white horse rider. In Matthew 24, what's the first thing out of Jesus' mouth when the disciples say, hey tell us, when, when's this all going to happen? And the first thing before he gets to the wars and the rumors of wars and the famines and the pestilence and the earthquakes, what's he say? Watch out that no one deceives you. 
Right. Many are going to come mm-hmm. claiming that I am the Christ. It's all correlation to the same event. Matthew 24, Daniel chapter 9, Revelation 6 is the beginning of the seven year tribulation. And we're talking to pastor and teacher Billy Crone uh, about his new book which is entitled The Seals. I don't know how many pages are in this book. It is, uh, it's loaded with information. I, I'm looking at uh, 360 pages roughly. Mm-hmm. And what I would like to say at this point is we haven't even begun <laughs> to investigate the myriad of detail that you cover in this book. Yeah. Uh, we've, we're taking a broad brush approach yep. right now. We have gotten into no details, but but you talk about each of the of these horses. You talk about why they are horses, mm-hmm. how, why they are colored the way they are, and the biblical precedence for this, the history going back to Prophet Zechariah and so forth. Yeah. You talk about what each of the horses is doing mm-hmm. and the consequences, and so and you go into incredible detail. I've just got to tell you, what a what a piece of work. Well, and again, that's what we wanted to do. We didn't uh, want to gloss over it, uh, just like we did with the previous documentary that uh, this follows mm-hmm. up on, uh, the rapture. Yeah, we we didn't want to just talk about the rapture. We wanted to go down deep on it. And by the way, you have a book, and uh, I believe seven DVDs here. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we have offered these to you for some. A while now on the rapture, and he's he's gone and done <laughs> something very similar, except I think much more detailed. Yeah, uh, with the seals, we have uh, the book, and in this case, ten DVDs. Yeah, all about the seven seals. Now, can you imagine that, folks? I just stop and think about it. You've probably most of you've read uh, Revelation chapter six. And you've read through it and said, mm, I don't really understand all that. Well, read what Billy has written and you're going to understand all that. Yeah. Well, and again, that's because we wanted to take our time, not toot my own horn or anything. We want to be faithful with the research, Gary. And, um, and that's why it turned out the way it did. Literally, at, at times, literally word by word, just tearing it apart. And, you know, our rapture study, the documentary was 17 hours. This one's 21 hours. Wow. And uh, so it's, we just want to be exhausted. But we're going to deal with this. Let's deal with it in its full uh, fury, if you will. And that's probably a good word, fury, uh, because I wrote in the preface uh, two things that really popped out at me when I was doing this study. And, I, and I've read through, how many times you read through uh, Revelation 6? I don't know how many times, right? But there were even things that popped out at me because I f- forced myself to do a six month study, just tear it apart. It just blew me away. And one of them, again, was what we've already talked about. I, man, I, I can't believe how many times God is reiterating that this first half is coming from Him. This is His wrath, right? Number one. Number two, I think sometimes in the church, and I think it's from these same group of people that want to squeeze the church in the first half, mm-hmm. in the sealed judgments, but I think sometimes we downplay the first half. We act like it's not going to be as bad. Now granted the second half is called the Great Tribulation. Right. It is going to be worse. But we kind of downplay it like, well this ain't really going to be that bad. Are you kidding me? <laughs> when you start tearing it apart like we did, this is the most, it's a horrific scene that's going on here. You don't oh, want to be in first or second half. Well, let's let's just talk about the fourth seal. Now I'm yeah. skipping ahead, and, I, and we're going to get back to the first seal in a minute. But, but you, just to, as an illustration of how horrible uh, things really are, when the fourth seal is opened, a lot of people die. Yeah. How many people, approximately, g- given the way this verse reads, how many people would have to die to fulfill this this yeah. prediction? Well, he, John gives us the number, and it's one fourth of the earth. Now, Gary, stop and think Which about that. Which is how many people? Right. You, you do the population today uh, where we're at about now, roughly this is close to 2 billion, two billion. people. Wow. Close to 2 billion, not 2 million. 2 billion people are going to be annihilated in just the first half mm. of the seven year tribulation. And that's just the fourth seal, up, right? So, excuse me, you, this, you're going to downplay that? I don't know about you, but, and then do that. I mean, if you do the math, if you want to do the math on that number, two billion roughly, that's basically all of China, not some of China, all of China and all of the United States gone, wiped out, gone, disappeared from the planet, not just disappeared, but died a horrible death. And we haven't got into this, what's going on with the other seals and yeah. verbiage is very horrific. But can you imagine, you just wake up one day and all of a sudden every single person, man, woman, child, in all of China and all the United States is gone forevermore from the planet. That's around your two billion mark. And again, it's not just two countries. That's the amount of mass of people that have disappeared under the wrath of God that John mentions here, a fourth of the earth, 
all over the earth. That's how much, just in the first half, the planet will be depopulated under this wrath. And these are innocent people, many of them. The bystanders, they're people running for their lives. Yeah. And, and you come to the fifth seal and we have the altar of God and souls under that mm-hmm. altar, altar yeah. uh, saying, how long, oh, O oh Lord? Yeah. And uh, talk about passionate, how yeah. long, O oh Lord? Yeah. You know, sometimes we say, how long, O oh Lord, until the rapture. Yeah. But, but for them... For those who have gone on into the seven-year tribulation, yeah. when they say, how long, O Lord, yeah. it's a whole different thing. Well, and, and we bring that out too, because yeah. again, as, you, as you're right there, that's a whole other aspect. And this is the benefit of taking your time, go line by line, verse by verse, pull out every single word, what's the original language say? But when you take a look at that, and it says there what these people do, it says they called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, like you said, Right, and they're crying out for God to dish out justice, His vengeance on these people. Yeah. And and listen, it says that they had been slain. The word they're slain in the Greek is sfadso. Sfadso means literally to not just kill, but it means to violently butcher. It's a very strong word that's used. Yeah. These people weren't just killed, Gary. They were violently butchered. Who were they? These are speaking of the people who get saved in the seven-year tribulation. It's not the church, and I go down deep and we explain why it can't be the church, etc. But these people are violently butchered. For just what? Because they were followers of God. They maintained the testimony. Listen, don't follow the Antichrist. No, this is a, a ruse. This guy's a deceiver. They were not just killed. They were violently butchered. Now, the word they're called out Right? Yes. It's Krodso. Krodso doesn't just mean called out like, excuse me, excuse me, how long? Right? You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, the word there literally means to scream. These guys are screaming out. Now, loud voice is mega faunas, phonus, right? Where right. we get the word mega phone. So these guys aren't just saying this in a megaphone, which amplifies, combine it with Krodso. They are screaming through a megaphone. Now, can you imagine somebody speaking to a megaphone for you? But imagine somebody screaming through a megaphone. That's what these people, they were violently, and you put the timing together, right? Yes. Set the scene. When you set the scene, what's going on here in the original language, it is a horrible scene. These people, followers of God, this is how wicked it is on the planet this time. You don't want to be in the first or second half. They're literally violently butchered, right? Just, it, it, I don't even have time to get the, they literally cut up in the, it's just horrid, right? And they're violently butchered. And so if you could picture on the one moment as your a person's being violently butchered, ah, the next moment, bang, they stand before God and they're there at that altar and they what? They scream. So one minute they're leaving the earth screaming, ah, and then they end before, God, how long, holy and true, Will you judge the inhabitants of the earth? Avenge our blood. I mean, if you talk about an absolutely incredible, horrific scene. And again, that's just a little teaser of what's going on here. And for people to sit there and say, oh, the first half, it's not that bad. This is just coming from man or Satan having a little uh, fit or something. <laughs> hey, you're you listening to Pastor Billy Crone expressing himself, which he does in great depth and detail in his book called the the seals, and I want to tell you, uh, there is so much detail. We've skipped around through the seals right now, back and yeah. forth, to make a point. But when you go into the details, like the first seal has a number of things. It has the bow. It has the white horse. Yeah. What what do all these things mean? Riding forth. What kind of apparel is this man on the white horse wearing? Yeah. Uh, some some sort of a crown, and Billy goes into great detail to explain what each of these symbols mean, one by one by one by one. And mm-hmm. you have done a work, let me tell yeah. you. And well, and you know, God certainly gets the glory for that, Gary. And uh, it was a privilege. It was a lot of work. I'll tell you what. But again, that's our mindset. We don't want to just deal with the topic, be it the rapture, be it the first half of the seven year tribulation, the seals. Mm-hmm. We want to do our due diligence. We want to go down deep. Uh, and, uh, and and just share with what really God is trying to get across uh, with us. And the thing that makes your book distinctive to me is that I think of all the books that I've ever read about the seals of Revelation, yours is far and away the most detailed. I mean, you, you chase down each and every allusion or detail or fact to the point that it's almost microscopic. Yeah. So you are to be congratulated. Well, hey, that's the Lord, Gary, and that's what we wanted to do. That was our mindset. Let's just not deal with it. Let's not just gloss over it. Let's literally go line by line, verse by verse, oftentimes word by word, and bring out in its fullness what is God trying 
to get across to us in this first half of the seven year tribulation. And it is absolutely horrific. Uh, number yeah. one, for people to say that this is man's wrath or Satan's wrath is ridiculous, ludicrous, and I'll say this word blasphemous, number one. But also we have a tendency to downplay this first half like ah, it's not really that much to be concerned about. Or and, and yes, the second half is worse. That's why it's called the Great Tribulation. But man, when you see what's going on in this first half, it, you don't want to be in either one. And so we literally went line by line, let's see what's going on here. Gary, this is, this is absolutely horrific. I keep using that word because it literally is, it's like a, like a horror, horror flick. Uh, in fact, remember back in the day the, the, uh, in the Christian circles, the Frank Peretti novels? Oh yeah. Remember that? I do. And people got into that. It's like, ooh, that's all kind of creepy. It's just kind of, what's, what's going on with spiritual warfare and demons and you know, a lot of fiction? <laughs> oh well, yeah. This is not f- fiction. This is real. This is fact. And, but it reads like a horror flick when you start peeling behind the layers of what's really coming to the planet just in the first half. Well, let's take Re- Revelation 6, uh, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, that would be the first of the seals, yeah. and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. Now it says beast in the King James, but mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a, one of the, the throne guardians of God, mm-hmm. the cherubim. Right. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. Now mm-hmm. I'm going to stop right there. Yeah. The word bow. Mm-hmm. In your book, you have chased down the word bow. Mm-hmm. I mean, completely. <laughs> You've gone at it from every direction. Yeah. What yeah. is this bow? What does it really mean? Well, you know, uh, I, I believe that it's a, it's a twofold, uh, certainly, in what's going on here. Uh, traditionally, people will say that the bow, it doesn't mention arrows, so this is basically dealing with the Antichrist yeah. arriving on the scene with a false peace. And I do believe that. But I, I believe that not just because of the bow, not just because of Revelation 6, I believe it because contextually the parallel passages that go along with this, Daniel chapter 9. This is the beginning of the seven year tribulation. What starts it? When the Antichrist makes a what? A covenant, a treaty, right. if you will, a peace treaty with Israel. So we know it starts off with just this era of peace. And, and certainly the bow doesn't have arrows and that could be that too. But also even contextually you look at the second seal and it's not just war. It says before he gets to that, he says, and they were given power to take peace from the earth. So there, mm. there seems to be a peace that goes on there. However, what's interesting is the bow there, even scripturally, but also historically. We deal with the Parthians and the Romans and all the historical context, because they are the ones who use the bow that's mentioned here. But the, bo- the bow was also a warring instrument, right? And just because it doesn't mention arrows doesn't mean that uh, this Antichrist guy doesn't have warring intentions. Uh, he certainly does. He'll show his true color, sh- uh, sure enough, in the second seal. Uh, but I think it's a both and. I don't think it's an either or. Certainly uh, he comes writing in on this false utopia, this false peace. He was able to do what nobody could do. He brought peace to the Middle East and, and the world scene and all this guy's the world savior. He's incredible. But behind the scene he also has his warring intentions. The bow then <clears throat> being a symbol of false peace. Yeah. You know, it, really it's a symbol of God's peace it, when, when uh, the water dri- drained away after the great flood mm-hmm. and, and um, uh, Noah was given a sign in the heavens, the bow. Mm-hmm. And have you ever wondered if maybe this isn't uh, an expression of that same sign? Well, well, I, I, the Antichrist, of course, he's the Antichrist. Right. He's the opposer of Christ, in place of Christ. And that's what he does. Because he comes, again, this is another aspect, he comes on a white horse. Now, you, And we did all the, the yeah. study on this. What's, why white? Not just why a horse. The horse is basically the battle tank of the day, and that's another aspect. Uh, but uh, why white? White in the scripture symbolizes purity and righteous. Well, is this right. guy righteous? Absolutely not. That's but that's true. what the Antichrist does. He gives this false sense of purity that he's a he's a righteous guy here to help us, and and he's uh, he's here to bring in this peace, and he's so great, and yay, the planet, and, and and all that stuff. And yet, but he's hiding his true intentions. He's an Antichrist. He's a faker. He's an opposer in place of Christ. He's a false Messiah, right? That the scripture warns about. And his white horse mm-hmm. sort of speaks of the false Messiah. Yeah. Oh, speaking of detail, white horse, man, we go into great detail on the triumphal procession of the Roman emperors when they would come back from a time of victory. There's so much that pops out there that certainly fits what's going on in the scenes with this arrival on the world scene, this Antichrist mm-hmm. figure. Uh, with the Roman procession, including coming in on a white horse. But all the things that comes, all the bells and whistles, this is a huge massive global party. I think that's what's going to go on here too. But also with the Roman triumphal procession of these guys, 
these victors, they would literally be considered, quote, godlike. Mm. Right? Godlike with their, and that certainly fits the context of the Antichrist that Paul fills in the blank. He goes into halfway point of the seven year tribulation. Again, Daniel mentions this, Daniel 9, Jesus in Matthew 24. Halfway into the seven year tribulation, what's he do? He goes up and he just doesn't, cons- he, he accepts the world considering him godlike because he brought in this false peace, right? But he then says, no, now you will worship me as a god. He goes and declares himself to be God. And see, that was the difference. Was little, all these nuggets, Gary, keep popping out when we did the research. He, the, 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 the triumphal procession, they had a, a guy that followed the guy, and literally the whole time he was whispering, in, it's real cool, he was whispering in his ear, okay, hmm. you're not a god. Now the people treated him like that, but he was to be reminded, don't get a big head, you are not a god, and look behind you. Now, you add to that with this guy, he says, and this guy didn't just ride out in his triumphal possession, right? He's godlike, right? The yes. world accepts him, right? He rides out as a conqueror bent on conquest. So this guy doesn't look behind. He doesn't say, oh, I'm, I, you're right, I don't want to get a big head, I'm here to serve the people, right? No! This guy, he's bent on conquest. He, once he takes the scene, he takes the bait. Everything that Jesus rejected of Satan in the temptation, Matthew chapter 24, ultimately where Satan drops the bomb on Jesus, and of course Jesus uh, refuses. He says, you know, bow down and worship me. I'll give you all the splendor of this world. This guy accepts. Jesus rejects the true Messiah, but the Antichrist, the false Messiah, he takes the bait. Mm. And he runs with this baby. He, he says, no, I, get out of here. I'm not listening to your whispers. I am God-like. In fact, I'm going to Tell people you've got to worship me as God. That's what starts this thing. It's a smoke screen. It's a false peace. He rides onto the scene and then he shows his true colors mm-hmm. very quickly. And that's what you see in the second seal there, right? With it going on there. And it, 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 he comes out on another horse. And again, the horse, we, we deal with this extensively. And, I, and Gary, I can't, there's so much going on here. Well, the horses are different to, uh, colored. <clears throat> yeah. They, are, they seem to have different functions. Uh, you go all the way back to Zechariah, mm-hmm. uh, which also has a horse uh, imagery. Mm-hmm. Different, in fact, you you show that there are four different colors of horses in Zechariah, yeah. which foreshadow Revelation. And by the way, I love the way you treated that subject because it makes it clear and easy to understand. Yeah, a lot of people have written about Zechariah's horses, but I think you really nailed it. Yeah, well, and the same thing back if we back up just a hair on the first one. You know, there's actually some people that say, well. Gee, it's a white horse, so this must be Jesus. <laughs> no, no. And we deal with that in great yeah, detail. This yeah. is the Antichrist. This isn't Jesus. Contextually, he, Jesus, it says right there, and the Lamb open. Mm-hmm. So Jesus is the one who's initiating these judgments, not man, not Satan. Uh, but Jesus is in heaven unlocking these things, giving the orders for the living creatures uh, to unleash this judgment. So he's not going to be on the yeah. earth. Also, uh, Jesus doesn't come, this is at the beginning. He doesn't come until the end, yeah. right, with that, etc. So so once you get behind the scenes of what's really going on, there's a lot of things that people are very quick to say, oh, this, I think this is, you can't say that. And and I'm not here just about like debating people. I want to know what it means. And and I think we can know confidently what it means, but you got to do your homework with that. But But again, the second seal, the false peace, it doesn't last long. Now, hmm. it's all conjecture. We don't know how long but we know it can't last that long because it is taken away there in the second seal. Peace is gone. Now, contextually, this is the seals, all the seals are in the first half of the seven year tribulation. So here we are just in the second seal. So, how long does this false peace last? A couple months? Uh, uh, a year? We don't know, but it mm-hmm. ain't that long. We can be confident about that. Yeah. But it says here, listen to this, Gary. Again, people want to downplay the first half, like, ah, oh, it's not too bad. You say, Watch this. Okay. Right? He says there, he comes out on a red horse, right? And its rider was given power to take peace from the earth. So here goes a false peace. Here comes, right. and what's it replaced with? And to make men slay each other. Now, first of all, notice he says just men. He doesn't say armies. And a lot of people say, well, this is the war seal, and that's what we call it. And, uh, and so we go, oh, war is going to break out on the planet. Well, I, I do believe war will break out on the planet. But sometimes we have this mindset, just like today. Like we sit there, we're watching the war on the planet, we'll get updates on the news as we're sitting there eating our nachos, right? We're just kind of disconnected from it. That's not what's going on here. There is no disconnect. This is going to involve the whole planet. He didn't say armies 
slay each other. He says men. Mankind is literally going to slay each other. Now the word there slay is fadso and it means to literally not just butcher, it means to violently butcher. And then he says to him was given a large sword, megas makara. Okay, that sword was a precision instrument that was used for cutting up flesh. So you put all this together, and again Gary there's so much more in the book, I'm just hitting the highlights here. We go into massive detail (laughs) on this. But real quick, (laughs) What, what's the scene that goes on here? All of a sudden this false utopia, oh the Antichrist, he's the greatest guy since sliced bread, he's wonderful, he's our savior, right? <sighs> next thing you know, the next judgment from God, the Lamb opens up the next seal, and what happens? The whole planet literally erupts in this murderous spirit. They literally begin to butcher one another. Not just armies yeah. against armies, Americans, if you will, against Americans, uh, British against British, Russians against Russians, Chinese against Chinese. You're sitting at a restaurant, and next thing you know it erupts and people start killing each other. You make it out into the street, and it's just people are shooting each other. It's just, it's civil war all over the place. With pe- it, Gary, the scene is so horrific of what's really going on here. And this is just the second seal. And, again, and you know, it's interesting, red, that when the great armies of the world call themselves red armies. There's yeah. a red army in China, red army in Russia, yeah. and we know what that means. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and believe you me, because again, we went line by line, verse by verse, literally word by word oftentimes, and so we did a whole scriptural study on red. And when you take a look at that, it's not good. <laughs> It is not good. It's a bloody, <laughs> right. murderous scene that is erupting where you can't, dis- the people on the planet this time, you can't distance yourself from this seal. You can't sit there and be watching TV, wow, it's pretty bad over there. It involves the whole planet. Wow. And it is a, a butcherous scene. Now, then you get to the third seal, right? And again, by the way, we talked about this before. Notice how every single seal is opened up by who? Every single one. The Lord. the Lord. In fact, the He's the only one who can open the seal. Exactly. Nobody else in the entire universe is qualified. Right, which tells you where's this coming from. This ain't from man. Man's not instituting these disasters. This is the judgment of God. This ain't coming from Satan. This is coming from the Lamb. And God is being repetitious about it. And that's the biblical interpretation rule. Anything you see in the Bible that's repeated, yeah. right? it's not just that God is holy. He is what? He is holy. He is holy. He is holy. Now all His attributes are important. But for some reason God really wants to make sure that we understand He is holy. I think I understand why. Because His holiness explains a lot for us, right? And so here we see not just once, not just twice, every single seal, seven for seven, God says in the first half, the Lamb, God is the one who is instituting these judgments. This is not man, this is not Satan. But next what He says is this, and then comes this black horse, right? And basically you got famine conditions. That's why we call it the famine seal. And we know that contextually, right? And, the, and then it gets so bad at this point, and still we're in the first half. We're still in the first part of the first half of the seven year tribulation and, and food gets doled out on a scale. And again he says there basically you get a quart of wheat for a day's wages, three quarts of barley for a day's wages, don't damage the oil and the wine, right? And so basically uh, uh, you got famine conditions, it's so bad that you have to work a whole day, a denarius, basically a day's wages, for what? One quart of wheat, which basically su- could subsist one person, or you get three quarts of barley. Barley was basically animal food, right? Right. right? So if you had a family, right, you could, you could opt out working all day long. It's like feed your family some dog food, okay? It's just very horrible conditions. And then it says, don't damage the oil and the wine. I don't have time to get in this. We get into this, Gary, again. And very, I, know, very deep. I know, by the way, how you do because I, <laughs> I've read that section. Yeah. And, and I was just really impressed by the detail. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about a bow or a crown, I mean, you go paragraphs on what is this crown. Yeah. Or a bow, you go paragraphs, page after page. Right. Or what does the color red mean? You go many, many pages. I mean, d- the details. What does black mean, by the way? Yeah. Well, that's, that's death, destruction, mourning. We wear black at funerals. This is a funeral scene. It's not good. It's horrible. And, and basically, back to this famine, we also we take a look at uh, 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 even modern day famines we, 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 to set the scene. What's it going to look like? Right when this global famine hits. So we took a look at, at some famines in uh, China, even recent ones when the communists took over. Most people don't realize that was a horrific famine. We even went back to the siege of Leningrad, right? And what happened to the people after that war? Because this follows the war in the second seal. What was the conditions? How did people try to survive? And Gary, one of the things, and we deal with this in great detail, uh, but to set a visual, basically you got the zombie apocalypse coming to planet Earth at this time. Let me explain. 
I'm not saying literal zombies, but basically the famine conditions historically, it's going to be amplified even more here. It's not just people are trying to uh, survive with food and all this stuff, uh, but we bring this out. Historical famines is so bad, Gary, listen to this. People historically, they eat anything they can get their hands on. And I'm talking cats, dogs, rats, uh, mice, rodents, insects until those are completely gone. Tree bark. Then they go, exactly, they go and they strip the tree bark, they eat tree bark, leather, sawdust, anything. Then when that's gone, every single time when we were dealing with this, they resort to cannibalism. And it's just horrid. And you know what's going to happen again, right, here on this scale, except it's on a, bl- in a scale. And they, they would literally, they would, people would, mothers, is, oh, this is it's horrible. Why people would downplay this first half is beyond me. Mothers would, would, would Strangle their own children just to feed the rest of the children their food, that, but it's their own child. It gets so bad. People do horrible things in times of famine. Uh, the people they would literally they're, they're, they would dig up corpses. Their 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 neighbors would die. They would dig the neighbors would dig them up so they could feed their family. They were literally eating dead bodies. Cannibalism, and you know it's going to be on a massive scale. And again, contextually, that's what goes on in famines in war. With the restraining influence in place. And uh, how far into the tribulation do you think we are by this time? You're just getting started, frankly. Just uh, the, early, uh, the early years. The early starts of this, yeah, because again, that peace doesn't last very long. Here comes this murderous spirit all over the planet, right? Next thing you know, guess what? You reap what you sow, you just destroyed the infrastructure and things of that nature. You got this global famine going on. And so it's, and, and again, uh, let me make this point, Gary. The whole time I'm going through this, Oh, by the way, the church is gone, left prior to all this, beginning the seven-year tribulation. The restraining influence is gone. And if this is what people will do in a famine today with the restraining influence still here, right. Gary, it's going to be infinitely worse. It is an absolutely horrific uh, macabre scene. But then, again, we've we got to keep going. The fourth seal, what, what's he say? Here comes another one. The lamb again opens this up. Here comes the living creature, gives the order. This is not man. This is not Satan. And here comes who? Listen to this guy. Chloros, death. Right? It's a palish green. It's like the first stages of death, and it's very fitting because at this point, it's death from here on out, man. Yeah, now I have to say, <clears throat> much has been said about the color. Yeah. Pale green, the color of death, but you really go farther than, than I've ever seen anyone go yeah. on, on that color. Yeah. Uh, I mean, let's, let's face it, folks, it would take maybe, what, an hour or two to read about what, you've, uh, what you have uh, written about this color. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, and, and again, we, I, we're not saying to toot my horn or anything of that nature. We want it to be exhaustive. What is God? Because God wrote it here. He wants us to know, right? And yeah. if anything, it, let me dovetail a little bit. Uh, the Christian, well, why do I need to know about the seals? We're not going to be yeah. there. We're going to be raptured out. Well, you need to know because one, if anything, this should add some serious impetus for you to get, you don't even want your worst enemy to be in this time frame. But when you realize what's going on here in the first half, you wouldn't want your worst enemy in here. You realize that we got to get busy sharing the gospel. That's actually one of the blessings of this SEAL studies is it gets us to get serious about sharing the gospel. But, but you go back here and it's this pale horse, the beginning stages of death, and it certainly fits the context. There, there's a reason why God says he, that's the color of that horse. But he's got a rider. His name is Death, Thanatos, Hades, Hades, the, the grave, right? And, and I'll have time to get into this, but basically the picture that's going on here in the Greek is as fast as death, they, people die, Hades is there scooping them up. It's like this uh, death assembly line is what's going on here. They, they die, Hades picks them up, chucks them into hell. Die, go to hell. Die, go to hell. Die, go to hell. It's very, very macabre scene uh, that's going on here. And then he tells us, well, how do these people die? Now the word there that's kill is different. Uh, it's not sfadso, it's not the butcher, it's apakteno, right? And it means to kill in any way whatsoever, right? And then he fills in the blank, how do they... Unrestrained killing. Yeah, and, and, and how, how does that happen? Well he, he tells us it's by sword, uh, which is a different sword than the other one mentioned, uh, famine and, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. And so we, we took a look at that. Again, you got the famine, the sword, you got the war and the, that's going on, but, but you got two new aspects here, the plague, pestilence, right? Uh, and the wild beasts. How does humanity know? Because uh, recently there was a movie uh, that was aired and, and it made the rounds. And guess what the subject was? When the natural world goes wild and beasts rampage through the cities and start eating human beings. Now, what gave people the idea to make that movie? Maybe they're reading Revelation 6 and go figure. Because, <laughs> Gary, that's exactly on top of this. 
And again, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping over a bunch because I don't have, we don't have time to go through all that. You can get it in the study. But imagine, that's really what's going to happen to the planet. Right? Now yeah. people say, oh, we don't have to worry about wild animals. They're all in zoos. Well, yeah, imagine the animals get out of the zoo. Right? And yeah. guess what? They're not the only ones going to be, uh, humans aren't the only ones going to be hungry in this famine. So are the animals. Yeah. Right? And it's really going to happen. And we, we, I mean, the statistics on that. I forget how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of zoos are all over the planet. Now imagine all those busting open, right? Now add to that, again, don't have time to get into this, but what's the environmentalist dream? Even here in America, right? Something called the Biodiversity Treaty, most people haven't even heard of, but they basically want to return America back into this nature, wild nature, and people only get to live in certain cities and all that stuff. Sounds crazy, but that's mm-hmm. what's going on. So they're repopulating wolves in the wild and all this stuff. They're bringing back all these wild beasts and stuff. Hey, one day they're going to turn on you. And they're going to be a part of God's judgment, right? And that goes back to the text in Amos chapter 5. It's like, you're running away from a lion. Guess what? Next thing you know, you turn around, a bear gets you. And then he says, you finally make it into a house. You put your hand on the wall, a snake bites you. And that's the same thing that's going on here. It is. There's no place to hide. And then, of course, then he says plague, uh, you know, pestilence, things of that nature. Okay. But then, again, the restraining influence is gone. I, I thought about this, Gary. Certainly you're going to have plagues and pestilence after this war and after this famine. Disease always follows that. However, the restraining influence is gone. I think that even chemical warfare could be used wow. at this time because there's no restraint. And all they're going to pull out all the stops. You mentioned that about 2 billion people would be killed. Uh, it, the, the, the figure given here yeah. would, would roughly amount to 2 billion people. That's a lot of people. Yeah, and again, you're still in the first half of the seven-year tribulation. Do the math. If this were to happen today, right? Obviously we're not in the seven-year tribulation today, but to use the statistics, Gary, that's about 2 billion people. You take one-fourth of the earth, that's about two billion people. And again, why people would downplay this is beyond me, right? This is horrific. You don't want to be in the first or the second half. You don't want to be in any of the seven-year tribulation. And what is being spoken about here, frankly, honestly, should scare you. If you're not saved, it should scare you straight to Christ. If you are saved, it should motivate you to get busy sharing Christ with the lost. Now I want to talk about your book for a moment, and then I'd like to come back and look at the fifth seal as okay. we go out today. We, have, we don't have enough time. We need, w- this book requires a lot of time because it's got a lot of detail. A lot more detail in the seals than you would think. Uh, when Billy researches something, he researches something. Uh, the details are all right there. And I think your main point, your main point is this. You don't want to be in the first half of the tribulation yeah. under any circumstances. Any circumstances. It's not an easy time. It's no. not a time when the church can slip through there and just pray to Jesus and everything will be all right. Yeah. It's not like that at all. Yeah, the church can't be there because this is so verbatim. God says this is coming from Him, the Lamb, the Lamb, the Lamb, the Lamb, every single time. And, uh, and we're not appointed unto God's wrath, number one. Number two, when you peel back at uh, the layers of what's going on here, Gary, this is absolutely horrific. Again, yes, the second half is worse, but this first half is no cakewalk. And again, even for those, I'm going to survive, you know, and just hang on, and, but you ain't going to make it. This is this global effects, global murder, global famine, global death, global yeah. martyrdom. It's, nobody's going to escape. And speaking of global martyrdom, in the fifth seal, <clears throat> the saints under the altar cry out, how long, O Lord? And, and it's with great passion. We talked about that on our last broadcast. Yeah. And then comes the sixth seal mm-hmm. uh, in which all the restraints are <laughs> loosed. And here we have the revealing of a little secret, namely that all the kings of the earth, all the great leaders, the wealthy men, the, the academics, they, are, they all suddenly realize, oh my goodness, yeah. this is what everybody's been talking about. Yeah, they finally acknowledge what's been going on the whole time. This is the wrath of God. Hide us from Him who sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. They'll admit this is coming from God. And, but what's interesting is what do they do? What's the response? It's a sad state of affairs for humanity. They don't repent. They don't get right with God. They, they actually call to the mountains and rocks to hide. They try to hide out from God. And that's a whole other aspect, Gary. We don't have time to get into uh. But right now, the militaries around the world, the rich around the world, the average Joe around the world, what are they doing? They're building these bunkers. They're trying to hide out in the holes in the ground and all this stuff. And it's like, are these people that are doing this right now, the people that are spoken of here in this judgment from God in the first half? Could be. Billy has the book, the DVD set. All that you've been hearing and much, much, much more because we just don't have the time. The Bible promises a special blessing for people who read and understand the prophecies of Revelation. 
for people who don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, reading the book of Revelation can be a terrifying experience. Asteroids, 100 pound hailstones, mountains and islands collapsing into the sea, and billions of people dying from war, famine, and diseases. John the Apostle wrote this book on the island of Patmos almost 2,000 years ago under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's a roadmap to the seven year tribulation. Jesus called it the worst time in the history of the world because it represents God's judgment on a wicked, sinful world. As Pastor Billy Crone has shared with us today, it's a place you don't want to be. Many churches spiritualize revelation and dismiss it as a work of fiction or avoid it completely, leaving people even more confused about the future. Billy Crone takes the opposite approach. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse, word by word, he examines a very controversial part of the book, focusing exclusively on the seven sealed judgments of Revelation. As you've heard Billy say, there are some Bible teachers claiming that the seals have already been opened and we are in the tribulation. We would disagree. We're looking for Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. But we do believe the opening of those seals is certainly drawing closer. Billy has put together 21 hours of research on 10 DVDs and a 400-page book documenting years of advanced research. His work will teach you about the ancient prophecies in the Bible and show you how you can avoid this terrible time that the Bible says will come upon the whole world. The Seals of Revelation book is available for your gift of $30 or more to Prophecy Watchers. The 21 comprehensive studies on 10 DVDs are available for your gift of $60 or more to support the work of Prophecy Watchers, with shipping included anywhere in the USA. Just call the toll-free number on your screen or visit us online at prophecywatchers.tv. When you order both the book and the Seals of Revelation DVD set for your gift of $100 or more, we have two special DVDs that we will include in the Seals of Revelation package. The first DVD is Gary Stearman's latest, entitled The Last Trump. The second bonus DVD is from Brent Miller Jr., The Coming Convergence, a chilling story of a young girl who wakes up one day to find herself in the tribulation. These two DVDs will help you keep your family and friends out of the tribulation period. And as always, we'll ship the whole package to you for free anywhere in the USA. There is a dark time coming, but God has given us advanced warning of the things to come. Perhaps today is your wake-up call. Fortunately, God has given us a roadmap and an escape plan. Our mission at Prophecy Watchers is to keep as many people as we can out of this terrible time of judgment. As Billy says, you don't want to be here to experience the horror of the tribulation. Join us in the rapture instead, and we'll see you here, there, or in the air. You will not regret opening up one of Billy's books. So much information in there. But you make the point. I'd like to go back to the point you make as we close today uh, about the fact that this is indeed the wrath of the Lamb. In mm. other words, the full wrath of the Lamb doesn't wait until the second yeah. half. No. It begins in the first half. No, and you can't, I'm sorry, if you're being honest with the text, there's no way that you can derive that, Gary, at all. Uh, in, in fact, I, I get, a, a, if you will, a word from the Lord about those who, who just, because sometimes these people like, Oh, I'm going to be the ultimate survivor in the in the first half. It's not really that bad. And I'm just going to store my survival gear, make it out to my bug out shelter. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, uh, for, uh, anyway, this is from Amos. Amos chapter five. It says, "Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? The day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion, only to meet a bear. As though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall, only to have a snake bite him." Nobody's going to escape. You don't want to be in the first half, the second half, no matter where you ain't going to make it to a bug out shelter. The point and the message of the seals is to seal a different fate, make sure you're saved before it's too late, and avoid the whole thing. It's always fun to talk with you, Billy, but more than that, it's edifying, and I really appreciate the conversation. Thanks well, for coming. You betcha. Thanks again for having me, Gary. I'm Gary Stearman.
hey, you keep watching.